So, sir, thanks for joining us today on Leadership Log, which is a podcast for the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center community on topics of interest. And the topic of interest today is learning about AFMETCAL. Uh, so, sir, if you could introduce yourself and, and uh, tell us a little bit about your career background. Well, uh, wonderful, Daryl. Thank you. So I'm Carl Unholtz, and I'm a retired Air Force comm officer. And so as a government civilian, I'm a logistics manager. And so currently I'm the director of the Air Force's metrology and calibration program. And we also have uh, Edward Wood. My name is uh, Lee Wood. I'm, uh, I'm currently the uh, AFMET Cal's Chief of Plans and Analysis Section as well as the TMO Repair Network Manager. I have spent 24 years active duty in the Air Force, all of it in the PML or the Precision Measuring Equipment Laboratory and the Metrology and Calibration areas. Uh, following my retirement, I've spent the last 13 years here at AFMET Cal. And next. Yeah, my name is Larry Cotton. I am the Mechanical Engineering Branch Chief. I've been at AFMECAL about 15 years, and I spent the first half of my career in the Electronics Engineering Branch, then moved over to the Mechanical Engineering Branch, and then I was promoted to Branch Chief last year. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Jeremy Latsko. I'm the uh, Technical Expert for Metrology and Calibration. I've been with the program for about 18 years first seven as a mechanical engineer, and then the next 10 as a section chief and branch chief positions and about a year now in this position. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jonathan Jones. <clears throat> I've been here uh, in the Air Force for almost 20 years. Um, coming up in May, I'll be my 20. Uh, I've been on the FMECL team for just over a year and it's been a good time, so thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jill Watson. I'm the product support manager and chief of logistics here at FMET Cal. Uh, I've been with the program about coming up on two years. Uh, prior to that, I was a senior logistician in the F-35 program. And this is about my 20th year with the Air Force. So glad to be with you today. Thank you. So that's everybody on the team here today. Uh, Mr. Unholtz, if you could uh, give us a little background about FMET Cal and, and its mission. Terrific. So I'll break this down a little bit. First of all, AFMECCAL in itself is an acronym. So that's the Air Force Metrology and Calibration. And so metrology is the science of measurement, things like time and distance, for example. And the calibration portion of it is, uh, for example, you have a, a component on an aircraft that requires testing. And so therefore, uh, that test device that performs that test on the aircraft has to be calibrated. And so you're comparing that test device with a known standard to make sure that it is operating correctly and to the precision that you need. And so AFMETCAL is located at Heath, Ohio as a geographically separated unit. And so as a GSU, uh, we, we report to the Agile Combat Support Directorate there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, the Agile Combat Support Directorate then reports to the Air Force uh, Life Cycle uh, Management Center. And so um, we really have, uh, I'll break down the mission into three pieces. The, we have the responsibility for the overall management of the, again, the metrology and calibration program for the Air Force. And the, the second part of that is the, essentially the acquisition and sustainment <clears throat> of uh, the Air Force's calibration equipment. And then uh, the third piece is where we manage the uh, essentially a, a worldwide network of calibration labs. And so uh, the, uh, those labs then uh, collectively uh, you know, provide the, the calibration support to both the, the Air Force and Space Force. 
So I, I know AFMAN Cal has a worldwide mission and, and you mentioned there the presence that you have at installations all over. Um, so for your team specifically in Heath, um, how many people do you have and, um, and, and are all, they all located in Heath or are they also at other locations as well? So very good. So AFMAT Cal, as it stands at Heath again, we're authorized 106 individuals, and those are predominantly civilians. We have a, a small cadre of military, uh, nine senior NCOs, of which uh, one is a chief master sergeant, another is a senior master sergeant. And so uh, at uh, AFMAT Cal, uh, you know, we perform the typical functions of a program office. You have your engineering, your logistics, finance, contracting, and so forth. Co-located with us is the Air Force Primary Standards Lab. And so uh, the AFPSL, as we call it, is uh, staffed by approximately 90 to 100 contractor personnel. Uh, the, the touch labor is contracted, and so it, um, it's not as definitive, but in that range. Mm -hmm. Their responsibility, they're the highest echelon of calibration within the Air Force. And so what that means is they then calibrate the standards uh, that exist in those uh, uh, calibration labs around the world. Okay, so those calibration labs around the world uh, are called uh, precision measurement equipment labs or PMELs as we call them. And those PMELs, uh, there's 65 in number of which 13 are overseas. And so uh, they range in size depending on the, the, you know, the size and type of the mission that they support. Uh, but collectively the community as a whole uh, amounts to about 1,800 people operating 1.3 billion in calibration assets, once again, on behalf of the Air Force and Space Force. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I read in some of the background about the repair network integration. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that program, sir? So uh, um, we brought Lee along, who's our uh, r and uh, uh, lead, and so I'd like him to uh, go ahead and give you a response for that. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Yes, Repair Network Integration, or RNI, and uh, it was a chief of staff initiative that created a global repair network support structure uh, that enabled enterprise visibility and allowed for a collaboration of repair capabilities. RNI resolves repair constraints using available resources within networks of like repair capabilities uh, to provide agile support to mission generation. Uh, at Matt Cal's role in r &I, uh, is focused on calibration. Uh, we manage the PML repair network, which Ms. Runholtz had mentioned before, we have 65 PMLs across the Air Force and, and Space Force at this time. Um, and we use the Air Force Primary Standards Laboratory here at Heath as actually a direct enabler to the network. We have a, what's called metrology calibration flights at each of the three air logistics centers that provide calibrations for the depot specific equipment at their location. Uh, the network uses a, a, a total force approach for manning. We have contractor operated PMLs, uh, military PMLs, and civil service PMLs, a lot of which four actually belong to the Air National Guard. Our, uh, the PML repair network objectives are to maximize calibration efficiency and effectiveness, as well as to re achieve uh, rapid, flexible, and agile responses to supplement mission generation. Mm -hmm. In order to get the calibrated equipment to and from the customer quickly, we collaborate with many people, item managers, engineers here at AFMAT Cal and other places, uh, PML managers, uh, the MAGCOM functional managers, and many others to resolve constraints to get the flow of the equipment going. Uh, one of the advantages the network, PML network has is the uh, lateral support process, which is centrally managed here at AFMAT Cal. When the PML lacks, uh, has a temporary lack of capability or a restraint preventing calibration, 
They simply have to enter the uh, ID number of the equipment into a lateral, an AFMEC how developed uh, web-based application. And then uh, we have a lateral support manager here looking at that. And since we have enterprise capability of uh, visibility of the capabilities in the Air Force, uh, then we're able to determine where to be best for that to be calibrated. So this was a, a big improvement for the, as we became a network. Uh, previously, each of the MAGCOM female functional managers would, would separate this uh, lateral support on their own. So we effectively had about nine separate networks out there. So the lateral support management here at FMECAL has really helped us to uh, get the equipment to and from the customer quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and, and if you could, sir, could you give us a couple of examples of like what, what kind of equipment uh, are you talking about? And, and okay. For equipment for us uh, that PMOs will be doing, everything is called test measurement and diagnostic equipment, uh, or TMDE, as, as we refer to. Uh, and that could be anything that, that measures. Uh, we have a wide variety. It could be things as a torque wrench, a pressure gauge, a micrometer that measures, uh, anything that measures dimensional me measurements. It could be a scale. It could be uh, signal generators, spectrum analyzers. You know, so we go from the from some of the simpler items to some really complex. Uh, mm -hmm. So your Air Force needs calibrated. So you're calibrating the equipment that um, people in the field would use to actually do the maintenance. Is that okay. is that correct? That is correct. Right. Okay. Whatever they're using to do the maintenance and to work on the airplane. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, sir, it, is is there other uh, services or government agencies? Uh, either federal or state that you work with or, or even international partners as well beyond just the Air Force? The, our partnerships are quite extensive. And so I'm gonna ask Larry to address that for you and, and give you a glimpse uh, of uh, once again, the, the, the many uh, partners that we have to accomplish this throughout the world. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we do, uh, at FMECA, often we do coll collaborate and work with the other services. I would say the most no notable example of that is it's part of what we call the Calibration Coordination Group, or CCG. This falls under what, what's also called the Joint Te Technical Coordinating Group, or the JTCG. But we, along with the Army and the Navy um, Standards Labs, as well as NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but we'll serve on measurement subgroups where we often use NIST as a source for research and development and new calibration methods and standards that we would hope that we'd be able to prove our capabilities within our standards labs. Now, sometimes these projects are just for some single services. Maybe we're doing this on our, on our own or the army, but there's oftentimes where there's mutual interest amongst all of us. And this, this could sometimes help us because then we can kind of share the costs uh, for funding these projects. Um, a large part of what we do here at FMAC Cal as engineers is acquisition of Cal standards. So often when we're in the market research phase for these acquisitions, we, we'll usually often reach out to the Army and the Navy just to you know, somewhat get a gauge on what they're using in a particular measurement area. It could be something out there that we didn't know existed. Um, and this also goes both ways. I know I, I've personally assisted the Navy Standards Lab myself a few years ago when they were trying to uh, modernize their vibration and calibration standards. Um, in addition to that, there's also many instances where we have to use their calibration services as a customer uh, in lieu of, you know, going out for commercial uh, support if they have capabilities that we don't in-house. Um, I know, for example, the Army supports numerous items for our, our, our Kiln Bio and Radiac measurement areas. Um, we are also utilized as well, so it goes both ways. Uh, I'd say about a year or so ago, the Navy reached out to us to support them with some pressure calibrations, uh, calibrations when one of their standards needed repair. Um, obviously at that time, uh, getting repair in a timely manner was a challenge with COVID in full swing. So them being able to utilize us as a source uh, for calibration allowed them to be able to continue to support their mission. Um, obviously those are just a few examples I highlighted, but we do definitely collaborate with and support each other on a regular basis. Uh, so what are some of the things that the future holds uh, as far as uh, technology? I mean, uh, you know, the, the internet and, um, and just the rapid uh, evolving technology is changing just about everything. Uh, I can imagine that this has got to be impacting your field as well, sir. 
Um, what what are some of the things that uh, that you see coming down the pike? So uh, we're very much uh, involved in trying to uh, change the way the Air Force and the DOD as a whole does calibration. And so uh, Jeremy's our lead on that. So I'm going to let him talk to what he's been up to. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. It's extremely relevant uh, right now uh, as the measurement world is beginning to uh, leverage quantum technology that's going to change the way uh, we do measurements uh, forever. So in, a, in our calibration world, we talk about calibration, of course, we're going to you know, verify that uh, an item is performing properly to its specifications. But we're also talking about every measurement we make, we make sure that it's traceable to the international system of units, which is the SI. So in the United States, the SI, we achieved that through an unbroken chain of calibrations all the way through our National Metrology Institute, which is NIST, it's been mentioned before. So what all this means practically is if you're a user downstream, um, at some frequency, your item is gonna come due for calibration. You're gonna have to pull it out of service, and in our case, send it to one of our PML labs. Well, at some point in time, then the PML lab, their equipment needs to, will come due for calibration. So they got to pull it and then send it off to our primary lab. And at some point, the primary lab, the equipment comes due for calibration. So they got to pull it out and send it to NIST. And so the whole point of all this is to get traceability to the SI. So it adds downtime for everyone involved, cost, um, you're risking damage as you're sending equipment around the country and around the world. So a couple of years ago, the national, the international metrology community uh, redefined SI traceability to be to unchanging constants that exist in nature. Um, so like Avogadro's number, Planck's constant, speed of light in a vacuum is one that's easy to kind of uh, observe, uh, kind of picture. It's, this opens the door uh, with this forthcoming technology development to get traceability anywhere and any time. So you don't need those costly, timely, and those risky calibration chains anymore to get that SI traceability. So uh, this technology isn't out there yet, and that's, but that's where we're headed. And we're partnering with NIST, and they're using quantum technology to develop new SI traceable devices in a program called NIST on a chip. And so their vision really is to have NIST quality measurements anywhere, anytime that's compact in size, uh, fit for the application, affordable, and really importantly, commercially available. And so for us, the bottom line is with the mature NIST on a chip technology, we can have continuous uh, measurements that are inherently accurate and most importantly too is that they're integrated into the end user applications so they don't need to be removed for calibration to get SI traceability and so this on a chip provides great value to the Air Force the DOD and anyone who's making measurements uh, increased uptime you know readiness since the instruments can remain in service longer decreased equipment and maintenance expenses which are inherent and acquiring equipment and maintaining that calibration chain and decrease logistics expenses, improve confidence because you're not packing up your precision equipment and shipping it all around the world. And so as a program, we've been really leaning forward into NIST on a chip. We've been working, as Larry was alluding to, is working with our sister services. We've prioritized the best value projects and we've already begun funding a couple of these projects already. So that's kind of where we're at as far as technology and the future. You know, the, this redefinition of the SI is so important. And this quantum technology for NIST on a chip is gonna really change the way that everyone makes and maintains measurements for forever. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. I, I know in, the, in some of the, the buildup towards this, one of the questions that came up was why was uh, AFMET Cal in Heath? And, uh, and I know that uh, Mr. Anholz explained to me that it had to do with the seismic stability of the, of the location there. So, um, and, and so uh, I can see how the ability to, to standardize things or to measure things anywhere that you are um, really removes a, a, a great deal of the complexity and, and risk in shipping things around and, and, and savings from that regard. Is that correct? Or? Yeah, that's a big deal because the, the whole idea with setting equipment around is to get to that SI. And you get to that SI, it's best uh, realized in the United States through NIST. But if the SI now is realized through constants that exist in nature, anyone can get it anywhere. So it really <laughs> eliminates that calibration chain. Okay. All right. 
sir, I, I know that there's a um, there's an evaluation team that you also have in in the organization and uh, that performs evaluations. Can you uh, can you talk to a little bit about what they what they do? Absolutely, and, and uh, you're right, Daryl. Having an evaluation team is certainly uh, something that makes us uh, unique as a program office. And the folks on this team have to be among the the best that the Air Force has to offer. And so uh, one of those happens to be on this session and uh, Mass Sergeant Jones. So uh, him being on the team, I'm gonna let him uh, describe that for you. Thank you, sir. So the evaluation team is an AFI 90-201 attachment to Inspector General activity. They perform evaluations to determine risk and risk mitigation in the PNL's ability to detect non-compliance, implement and follow up on corrective actions to risk and proper management of PMOs to ensure safe, accurate, reliable, and traceable measurements. The team, as we call it, evaluates every PMO across all, all match comms, the United States Space Force, and multiple foreign military sales sites around the world. With FMECAL setting the policy and operation standards of the PMOs, the team provides immediate feedback to the PMOs on intent of policy, along with providing feedback to FMECAL on impacts that policy has in completing the missions from day to day. Uh, so, so you do you guys actually go out on scene and and evaluate other or or you go and visit the PMLs and, and do like inspections of them is that is that yes sir so we'll sit down and take a look at their data they uh <clears throat> each PML is required to submit their their information each quarter on the on different things their quality data their production and and stuff like that we'll take a look at that virtually and that'll take us a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll try to poke holes and try to find some risks in their strategies and their, in their quality programs and management systems. And then uh, we'll go down, <clears throat> we'll sit there with them for about a week and uh, perform a measurement capability assessment to ensure that they're performing calibrations properly. Also while evaluating their quality program and management systems on site. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think you mentioned a foreign military sales component as well. Uh, sir, is that, is that also, uh, uh, one of the missions or services that uh, AFMEL Cal provides? Yes, indeed. That's uh, uh, a large part of our portfolio, portfolio actually, excuse me. And, and that falls under uh, a number of things that uh, Jill manages for us. And so I'll have uh, Jill describe that FMS presence for you. Thanks, sir. So we actually support 37 nations for a, a variety of measurement and calibration support requirements. Um, that includes the, the total life cycle, whether it's a new system being acquired or sustaining existing calibration capabilities that they have in country right now. Um, for example, several nations in Eastern Europe are presently uh, procuring F-16s from the United States Air Force. Um, our, our job in that effort is to get their in-country PML capability activated. So that involves procuring the calibration equipment that they're going to utilize, as well as any technical orders uh, and supporting equipment, lab stands, ancillary devices that they need, need to activate those PMLs or to modernize existing PMLs that they have. Um, in order to do that, we have to collaborate uh, closely with the country manager, uh, the in-country service that is uh, receiving the equipment, uh, as well as, um, the program office, for example, F-16 program office, um, because our effort to activate the lab has to be tied to the overall activation schedule for the bed down of that system in the country. So we're looking at the timelines for the site activation for the PML facility and advising them on uh, what the facility requirements include, because obviously a lab environment requires special environmental controls and monitoring so that you have that lab lab control environment uh, to effectively calibrate the TMDE. Uh, additionally, lab personnel um, in the USAF go through a nine-month training course, um, and similarly, lab technicians for our FMS customers are going to need to be trained as well, so either we're going to collaborate with AETC's AFSAT team to get them training via the schoolhouse at Kiesler Air Force Base or through commercial training providers to make sure that they have the basics of measurement science uh, well understood and know how to calibrate all the equipment that's going to be delivered to the nation. So juggling those integrated master schedules, making sure you're meeting the squadron operations and first aircraft arrival um, deadlines, 
and the initial IOC capability and milestones, that really only gets you out the gate. And then once you're out the gate, you need to sustain what has already been delivered. So in that case, we have a, a plethora of sustainment cases as well. So that's going to bring them um, the repair and return of calibration standards that have failed. We have to bring them back to the United States in some cases when they don't have in-country in support available. Um, we also, there is just some things that you have to have a, a pretty large traceable piece of, of calibration equipment um, that is cost prohibitive in some cases. And so it's easier for them to send their standards back to the United States to be calibrated. Uh, either through a commercial provider or by the AFPSL. Um, so in doing that, the, the country managers also have to deal with all the fun of international trade policies and laws, resolving impasses with customs brokers and frustrated mm -hmm. cargo, um, all while overcoming language barriers, evolving customer relationships. Um, so it, it, it's a full-time job of um, a lot of juggling, of a lot of um, diverse product support elements. Um, one other thing that I'd point out is FMS customers tend to keep their calibration standards for a very, very long time. And in some cases, uh, the USAP has moved away from uh, this particular piece of calibration equipment. So finding um, repair sources for some of these aging systems uh, tends to be a, a, quite a cumbersome activity. But uh, the FMS country managers always seem to rise to the challenge, and I couldn't be more proud of them in that regard. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention for FMS is that we have um, a constant technical dialogue with them. We invite the FMS countries to join us for the PML Worldwide Conference that we host here in Heath every two to three years. Um, additionally, the eval team, uh, depending on the case, whether uh, they have requested it or not, they will actually go to the countries and do on-site evaluations of PML labs. Um, there were a couple that the, the team did right before the COVID pandemic kicked off. And so hopefully as the pandemic eases in the, in the forthcoming future, uh, mm -hmm. the EVL team will be able to support the FMS customers in addition to all the bases that they support for us here in the USAP. So that in a nutshell is the life cycle of support that we provide to the FMS community. Uh, and we've got a great team doing it and I couldn't be prouder of them. So thanks for the opportunity to spread the word about them. Thank you. So sir, that pretty much brings us to the end of our time, but before we close, I, I wanna see, is there anything that we've left out or anything that you'd like to go back and, and reiterate? Well, a uh, couple of things, of course, do come to mind, obviously. You can't exist in these times without being affected by the COVID pandemic. And so um, hugely, proud, obviously, of the fact that here we are dealing with some, you know, very significant technical, uh, you know, aspects of the business that we do, you know, uh, working with a fraction of a nanosecond or a fraction of a de degree at extreme temperatures and being able to, to work with those kinds of challenges to, you know, to the scope that we do, obviously, on an international scale, uh, which clearly um, country to country and state to state are dealing with, you know, different uh, COVID situations. And certainly uh, surges vary from uh, location to location. And so to be able to withstand all of that disruption, and yet, obviously, ensure there's been no disruption to the to the mission has mm -hmm. been a huge accomplishment. And again, extremely proud of our community as a whole. And also, uh, you know, recent events certainly have uh, brought to the forefront the importance of diversity and inclusion. And that's certainly uh, values that uh, uh, we embrace and recognize that that will also be very important to us uh, in the future, now and in the future, in meeting our mission needs overall. But hopefully you get a, a terrific um, picture here of the, again, the, the technical aspects of what we do, uh, very unusual. And uh, clearly it, it takes, um, once again, uh, a large number of uh, 
technically minded experts uh, to make that happen on a daily basis uh, for the Air Force and the Space Force. And uh, once again, uh, just uh, uh, it's it just thoroughly enjoyable to be a part of a team who uh, obviously does that so enthusiastically and often uh, for a whole career. Uh, and of course, uh, that greatly shows in the passion that they uh, bring every day to what they do. So, so thank you for the opportunity of sharing that. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, inviting us out to be part of this session. So thank you. Absolutely, it's, it's always comforting uh, to uh, people like myself to know that there's some really smart people that understand this stuff and are taking care of it because I know it's really important work um, and, uh, and, and I'm glad that uh, we've got the big brain people on our side helping us uh, get it done. So thanks for joining us today on Leadership Walk, sir. Wonderful. Thanks again, Daryl. Mm -hmm.